Thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, very honored to be here. Uh, and I'm excited to share some of my ongoing work at Stanford. So this is an outline of what I'll be sharing with you today. Um, I'm going to start off by giving some context. And I'm in the department of psychiatry in a medical school, so a lot of uh, what I know and what I deal with in mobile health has to do in the context of mental health care. So I will elaborate on one of the projects that I'm working on at Stanford, and I'll describe some characteristics of the problem. Each of um, the characteristics really entail a methodological need. Um, and I'm going to focus on one of those issues and continue with that issue for the rest of the talk. Um, and that issue has to deal with um, assessing the utility of information that we collect from um, wearables. In this particular um, project, as we're using watches. Okay, so um, this is also I wanted to acknowledge that this is um, an issue that was mentioned in Professor Murphy's um, chapter in, in her book, and um, I'm going to offer some of my uh, thoughts on the next steps of how to address this issue. Okay, so I'd be happy if this could um, be a springboard for further dialogue. On this topic. Okay, so it's been fairly well documented that um, the mental health care needs of the U.S. really extend beyond um, the existing health care services um, today, and thankfully, digital health technology is well poised to enable greater access to care. Um, this article was featured in Nature already three years ago, alludes to this shift in mental health care delivery. And um, it says here that mobile mental health apps have exploded onto the market, but few have been thoroughly tested. And even lesser is known, uh, less is known about whether these apps can adapt well to the unique needs of their users. Um, and that's a salient issue because um, apps need to be able to adapt in order for the users to engage and continue engaging with these products so that they can use them to um, support behavior change. So there's a growing literature, obviously, that um, demonstrates that the details of implementation regarding specific content um, of the intervention components and the sequence and the timing of the delivery actually matter in terms of app engagement and usage. And up until now, behavioral theory and um, specific psychiatric domain expertise is, of course, has been instrumental in guiding the design of um, these interventions that underlie these apps, but um, they don't tell us about human behavior at a very specific level um, when we're trying to design decision rules that tell us specifically how and when um, or when we should deliver these intervention components, especially in such a way that um, it maximizes the intended effects of, um, of the intervention. So the digital health industry really occupies a large part of the healthcare space and has been rapidly expanding. And um, our proximity just to the tech world where we are at Stanford, we're um, witnessing that. Um, and among the thousands of apps that are out there, uh, many of these apps offer various models of care, from being a standalone app uh, to being used as an adjunctive to clinical care. And they offer various tools of support, such as self-management, um, cognition improvement, all of these sorts of tools. And they span all stages of care provision, from diagnosis, treatment, to maintenance. And of course, if we're talking about commercially available apps, um, one doesn't need a clinical diagnosis to download an app and kind of start, one can use it right away um, as soon as someone suspects that they have an issue. Um, so these are uh, just some of the collaborations that I've been working on at Stanford. Um, and they mainly deal with the development 
and um, the testing of self-guided interventions that deal with the treatment of eating disorders and bipolar disorders. Um, I'm not going to really elaborate on these projects, but um, I think eventually, um, I think eventually these projects are going to ask questions that um, I'm dealing with today. So I'm going to elaborate a little more, bit more about a project that I'm working on. So um, Stanford kind of launched a new center for digital health uh, not too long ago. And as part of its inception, they um, released a uh, seed grant program um, in partnership with Apple. And they called for uses of the Apple Watch in healthcare. And so they awarded five teams at Stanford, uh, including us, which um, our team is just myself and another clinical psychologist. And our study is about improving adherence behaviors that relate to physical activity using Apple Watches. And for this study, we're going to be building an app. Um, and the goal of the app is to promote adherence to a daily fitness goal, um, namely the step count, among people in fairly good health by lever leveraging push notifications that are delivered by the watch. This might sound familiar. Um, so our main goal, or the scope of the project, is really a feasibility project. Uh, we have 300 watches that we need to distribute. Um, so our scope of work is really to build the app, um, make sure, ensure that it's running properly on the back end and um, overall, um, and distribute it and see how it goes with people who um, are, we're trying to have people wear these watches for eight weeks. And after we um, have completed this, we will have generated a data set for offline policy evaluation. So at onboarding, um, meaning the be very beginning of the study, we're going to have people complete a baseline survey on the iPhone, and that's one of the requirements to be in the study because we need an iPhone to, to actually use a watch. Um, and we have them first establish their desired physical activity goal. And I say daily goal, but it's not something that changes um, over the study period. It's just one goal that they will stick to, but they would are expected to reach every day. And then there is a set of questions um, uh, pertaining to demographics. Uh, then we ask, um, we ask them to select a set of value from a pre-populated list, and the rationale for that is we're not so interested in targeting reasons for not unintentional non-adherence issues, but we're trying to um, target inten intentional reasons. So, you know, this is a screenshot of what um, the user might see, and um, we say, take a minute and ask yourself, what are the things that give your life value? And they can choose one of these um, values. So the idea is that the, um, you know, the only thing that, and one of the biggest drivers of behavior change is really a trigger and then having your um, actions being anchored in, in something that you actually value. And then we ask, a, the users to select an image that best represents their value. Um, and after that, then we give them the watch. We have them wear the watch for eight weeks. Okay, and we will continuously collect data through the Apple Watch. So this is the key part of um, what we are doing. So we're going to be um, delivering messages to encourage people to stick to their goals. So we're going to, there are three different types of messages that we're uh, delivering, and the first type is a motivational type of message. So we have buckets of messages, um, and it, it's just, the intent is just to be encouraging. So um, that's an example. 
And the second type of bucket of messages is a values type of message. So this is a message that's just trying to remind them um, the value that they chose. This is a generic um, values message, but it could also refer to the, the value that they chose at baseline. The other type of message is the image that they selected at baseline. So it's supposed to trigger um, um, trigger their uh, memory of, of why they're doing this. And the last type of mess, well, the last type of action that we are going to do is we might not send anything, being mindful of how, um, of message fatigue, right? So where we are in the study right now, we're currently completing the development of the app. We're wrapping that up. Um, we're beginning recruitment. Um, we've just started to generate an interest list. So fairly early stage, but we have um, put some thought into, um, into the rest of the study. So I said that we would be collecting data from um, collecting data through the watches, and we'll be using the HealthKit um, store. So HealthKit is software development kit, um, essentially a central repository where all any, any health information is stored. Um, so the types of data that, um, that we could access are characteristic data. This is data that the user can input by themselves, um, some, some, something that's immutable. Um, sample data, this is information about the user's health, so that also depends on the types of medical devices that they, the user uh, connects with, um, with their iPhone. Uh, workout data, this is one of the most common types of um, data that we'll see. And um, in order to actually access that data, the user has to grant permission um, to the app. So the screenshot is the last step of the onboarding process. The user will need to um, grant permission so that we can actually get the data. And if this doesn't work, then we don't get anything. Um, so it is a pretty key step. Um, you'll notice that the more you ask, um, there's an option to kind of turn all categories on and just accept all, but there's I kind of, your eye goes to this list and um, you see that the more you ask, kind of the more items you need to swipe over. And another, um, another issue that I don't have on the slide is that um, the user does need to open the app each day for us to sync the data. So that's um, not trivial, but we plan on um, explaining that during the onboarding process. So speaking of um, practical issues, one of the practical issues um, in this study is that the frequency of the data queries to the HealthKit API um, impacts the app performance. So what we do is we send requests to the HealthKit API and then uh, we can customize the frequency at which we send those requests. Uh, for example, if I wanted to do a blanket data collection and I wanted to really capture every single burst of activity, I could um, send a query every minute of the day. Um, whether I should, um, that might not be wise because if the queries are too frequent, the app processing time ends up slowing down from the user perspective. So um, users are very, very sensitive to um, delays, and this is not something that we really want to um, compromise. Um, and then the other issue is that the frequency of the data query and the reward feedback are related. Um, and so this is just means that um, the reward cannot be more granular than the frequency um, at which we send requests to the API. So I'm gonna describe some uh, characteristics of our data um, collection or data issues that actually entail um, suitable methods um, to solve that. And first issue is related to the one that I just mentioned, 
and it deals with the data query frequency and how that's related to the reward. So our work around uh, uh, for that issue is that we're observing reward feedback once a day. We're interested in the step count over a 24-hour period. And that's partly because um, you know, we uh, really are interested in the kind of a longer, a very short but longer term impact of the, um, the message delivery. Um, we understand that we, I didn't mention that um, we're sending the messages at fixed time points over the course of the day and we understand that um, sending a message you know, during work commitments might not compel someone to move immediately, but that might trigger someone to uh, remember to do something later. Um, so we're really interested in the daily physical activity. Um, but I did mention that we have, we're sending four message types or choices over the course of the day. So what that really means is that um, there are 256 possible message sequences that are given. Um, and that's, that's a lot of actions. Um, so that's something that needs to be addressed. The second issue is that I ha we're collecting images. Um, and so this implies that the pictures can be used as factors. So um, perhaps feature reduction techniques or maybe contextual bandits beyond linear models, perhaps neural networks could be used and the last um, issue about data and the high volumes of data um, is the question of whether the watch could actually be useful. And this does align with some of, kind of the initial skepticism of the watch and um, that was more anecdotal. Um, but I'm going to expound upon this question for the rest of my talk. So one of the focal issues is whether the watch actually provides useful information, right? We're already stuck to our phones. Um, what, you know, what use could the watch be, right? Um, and so the health kit provides a lot of activity and health data. And this is the panel on the right, whoops, sorry. Um, the panel on the right kind of is, um, an example of the variables that we can get. Um, of course, there are various kinds of uh, costs in, in getting this in terms of the processing time. Also, if we were to get um, other types of um, data, just if we were to um, ask um, users, then that incurs a burden too. So um, we just have to be mindful of whether um, we're gathering information that's even useful. So it's a very practical issue that we're um, going to address. So in light of that, uh, testing the utility of the variables that are obtained by the watch really plays an important role. So this is what I'm going to be focusing on um, for the rest of my talk. So the Apple Watch study is really about delivering messages to motivate users to be active. And effectively, it can be framed as um, a sequential decision-making problem. And so we'll be uh, receiving watch data from users. And we'll, uh, there, our objective is to come up with a sequence of messages based on those inputs. Um, after those messages are delivered, we're going to um, observe their physical activity over the course of the day. And um, I kind of I put this figure because the flow of information that we are getting is really aligns with um, you know this depiction of an online decision algorithm. So we'll be getting the Apple Watch um, kind of inputs. And our objective is really to come up with the sequence of messages. And we're going to be trying to learn from the user's behavior in such a way that um, uh, we'll come up with a decision rule. Um, and the decision rule will be revised to maximize the success of achieving their goal. So those messages are updated every time we get inputs. Okay. 
And um, bandits can be used to address the sequential decision-making problem. I know that um, we've already gone through a little bit about bandits, but I'm going to just build up to what I want to, what I'm going to be talking about, and I just will review some of um, the framework. So I'm going to be building up eventually to um, contextual bandits and another type of bandit. So I'm going to just do it step by step. Um, so in multi-arm bandits, um, we're assuming the bandit has access to n arms, and at each time step. Um, the bandit pulls an arm, and associated with that, then we observe um, a reward. Okay, and um, we, oops, sorry. We, um, we say there's an optimal arm. Um, an optimal arm is that that yields the maximum um, expected reward. And there is a characteristic uh, of this problem referred to as the bandit feedback, which just, just means that the rewards um, for the arms that, we ha that were not chosen could not be observed. So the counterfactual rewards cannot be observed. And so that repeats. So after um, you know, that the next time period, um, another arm is chosen. And so the goal really is to, um, and the way Jesse framed it was maximizing reward, but it can be said as minimizing regret. And if we say that per period regret is um, the difference between the uh, mean reward under the optimal arm and the mean reward under the arm chosen by the algorithm, our goal is to minimize that cumulative uh, regret of all time periods. And as you've heard, um, every online decision uh, making problem it confronts, is confronted with a choice to exploit, um, which is acting best, acting, um, selecting arms that appear best. Uh, so for example, the greedy algorithm is a good uh, example of this, that it selects the arm that yields the maximum expected reward according to the estimates. Uh, a shortcoming of that approach would be that it forgoes opportunities to potentially explore other arms. So if an arm is, yields low reward um, kind of in the beginning and is not chosen based on uncertain estimates, you know, in the long run, that might not be the, the optimal thing um, for the algorithm. So to maximize reward, um, there needs to be a trade-off. So both of these principles should be incorporated. And unguided exploration strategies could lead to a cumulative um, linear regret. Um, and so there are other more directed exploration strategies that are desired, such as the upward confidence bound and Thompson sampling, that do a better job of addressing that trade-off. OK, so building up. Um, Contextual bandits are just an extension of um, multi-arm bandits, where we assume that the agent has access to um, other features, um, features that we refer to as um, contexts. And um, each, and as before, we are assuming that the bandit has access to n arms, and an arm is chosen and that each arm yields a user-specific reward, R. So there are two uh, stochastic sources here, um, one in the covariate and one in the noise. And there's an um, unknown parameter mu. And given the history, we assume the noise is Sigma sub Gaussian. Um, and the expected reward here is depends on the context and is linear in mu. And we assume some bounded in this. OK, so a value-based approach um, would be to kind of expend all of your energy into estimating the conditional reward. So to learn mu in order to find the maximum of the expected reward. Okay. 
So the agent uh, receives the context as input. Let's say there is an optimal arm, and here the goal again is to minimize the cumulative regret, where the regret, the definition is the same, it's just that um, the mean reward is linear mean here. So it's the expected reward under the optimal arm uh, minus the expected reward under the arm that's chosen by the algorithm. Okay. So in the previous slide, I talked about how the goal is to find the maximum of the conditional mean over the actions. So that problem becomes a little harder with a larger action space. Um, and there are alternatives. There are other alternatives that are more efficient at dealing with this problem. Um, so that motivates um, policy-based approaches, directly finding the policy. So as um, Jesse mentioned, policy is a mapping from a context to an action. Um, and policy gradient approaches explicitly learn the policy using a parameterized family of policies. So we're going to use pi to denote um, the family of policies, and pi is um, indexed by a parameter theta. And the problem is, given pi, we're going to find, given that we have a parameterized um, policy, we want to find the maximizer of the average reward. So we want to find theta that maximizes the average reward. OK, there, there, there's a yet another alternative to um, both value-based and policy-based, and that's taking a hybrid of the two um, approaches. So the after-critic approach um, uses two models. So the critic is uh, responsible for estimating the parameters of the reward function. And the actor is responsible for coming up with a policy. And it, so it uses the estimates provided by the critic to find the theta, the value theta, that maximizes the average reward. Okay. So that there are, two, there are two models in this approach. One is that there is a model for the critic model, which is the reward function here. And then um, there's a policy model. OK. So I want to just pause for, for a moment and just orient everyone as to why I am mentioning all of these approaches. Um, <clears throat> So a lot of the focus in the literature has been about regret bounds, and that's certainly been necessary to guide, um, to guide us on the design and analysis of online decision-making problems. But we really do need uh, inferential tools to resolve practical issues in mobile health, such as the one that I am addressing today, um, which is the problem of determining what information is actually useful. Okay, and so I'm mentioning um, Professor Murphy's um, recent work, so the um, Lai Tori Murphy paper, uh, which establishes asymptotic properties of the parameters of the actor credit bandit. And this work has been very important um, as it enables statistical inference. So using these results, we can construct test statistics to test whether variables are actually important. I want to say, though, that um, the validity of statistical tests are really predicated on the correct specification of the assumed models. So what happens when the models um, are incorrectly specified, it's not guaranteed that the test statistics based on those models are actually um, valid, they're asymptotically valid. And there's a little bit of um, literature and the statistics literature that addresses this issue, which we refer to as robustness to misspecification. Um, but in this problem, it's slightly, um, it needs special treatment because we have a different objective function. So I'm going to be talking about um, 
how to construct robust tests for testing the utility of variables. Okay, so I'm going to be leading up to that for the rest of my talk. Um, I'm going to have to go back and talk a little bit more about the actor critic, critic and the results about that in order to address how we're actually going to um, construct robust tests. Okay, so going back to the actor critic, I'm just being a little more concrete here. Um, the actor critic, I said, involves two models. The critic part, um, the critic involves the, um, the reward model. So we say that the expected reward, we're going to use R um, here to denote the expected reward from here on out. And the model for the expected reward is linear in U and involves this um, feature vector that depends on the context and the action. And we're going to say that this is our pi is given by this um, softmax policy. Um, and this gives us a probability of allocation. So, Again, just to reiterate, um, this boils down to an optimization problem. So once we have estimates for the reward, our task is to find the maximizer of the marginal expected reward. So we have, um, yeah, so once we have estimates here, um, we will um, find the value of theta that maximizes this whole thing. So in practice, we observe context, right, and we first start with an initial policy um, and but start, start with an initial kind of, um, right, start with an initial policy that will give us an action and we'll observe a reward and from that we'll estimate, we'll get an estimate of mu. And um, we use that critic estimate um, here to then find an estimate for theta. So I'm going to just um, skip over this with the interest of time, but it generally just it's what I said in the previous slide. And now I'm going to talk about the actor critic bandit in Lai's paper. Um, so in, in this paper, we assume that the contexts are IID. And there are two modifications that have been made in this paper. Um, first is that the reward has been truncated to enforce boundedness. And second, instead of maximizing the marginal mean V star, um, they're using a regularized version. Um, and these modifications have been made first to ensure that there, there, there's a stochastic policy and also that um, to ensure the consistency of theta, which is the um, parameter policy. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to consider a simpler um, regularized term, which for the purpose of this talk today is um, OK. Um, OK, so this was the bulk. This is really the main result here in that paper. Um, showing the asymptotic properties of the critic and then showing the asymptotic properties of the actor. Um, and so the, the actor has a normal um, distribution. The estimator for the actor has a normal, uh, is normally distributed with this um, sandwich variance. Um, and this is because the sandwich variance is because the um, theta is at the depends on the estimate for the um, critic. So if you remember when I talked about the optimization problem here, um, you know, the value of theta really depends on the value of mu. Um, and so that's why we have a sandwich, um, a sandwich variance. Okay. So those results were very important. Um, so we've sh that those results show the asymptotic properties. And they're important because that they enable um, us to conduct hypothesis tests of the parameters that are underlying the actor critic. Um, 
And so in order to conduct tests of certain variables, um, we need to use the properties of the actor. So we can't, um, if we were to rely solely on the properties of the um, critic, it might not be sufficient because some of the variables might affect the reward but may not affect the policy. So now that we have all of the ingredients that um, we need to conduct hypothesis tests, we can go ahead and um, construct tests to do that. Um, so how do we do that? Well, I'm considering now the case where everything is correctly specified. Um, reiterating again what the um, problem is, so we note that the average reward is a function of pi, the policy, and we'd like to find pi that maximizes um, V star, the average reward. So we just use an empirical version of that. Um, so we replace um, the reward and policy by the sample um, versions. And we can construct a test statistic for theta by um, using the score-like quantity here. Um, and we can proceed. Okay. So that's all kind of assuming that the model is correctly specified. Um, and I want to underscore, as I did before, that the validity of the tests are really predicated on correctly specified models. And in the after critic, we have two models. We have one for the reward and one for the policy. So since we have two models, we also have two sources of model misspecification. The critic here, R, and the actor. So then I want to ask the question, um, well, what happens to the validity of the test when one of the models is misspecified? Um, so first I want to address this question when the reward model is misspecified. I'm going to do that first, and once I've addressed that, then I'll talk about the second case when the policy model is misspecified. Okay. Uh, I think I will skip over that. Uh, so the first uh, point that I want to make about how to deal with, so before we kind of get into, um, dive into all of um, those expressions, I'm, the purpose of this is really to address the question of whether, what to do when the reward uh, model is misspecified. And the, there's something called a compatibility condition that many of you may already know about, but that helps us um, think about this. And the compatibility um, condition is just the following here. It says the gradient of the log of log pi with respect to theta is equivalent to the gradient um, of m with respect to the parameter w, where m could be any um, model for the context reward, um, for the war reward, sorry. Um, and so it could be any model in and here, here I'm considering that it's a linear model. Um, so for the critic, what we need to do is we need to minimize the expected sum of squares here by solving this um, equation. So the least squares estimator converges um, to a limit and that satisfies this equation. And for the actor, we need to um, maximize the average reward by solving this equation. So the limit of the estimator for the actor satisfies that equation. And I just put in red the portions of the compatibility condition, the expressions that relate to the compatibility condition. So by re-expressing the first um, expression, if we can um, just rearrange the terms and um, apply the compatibility condition, then we can come up with the third expression here, 
which is just saying if you see that um, it kind of resembles v, this V star, and it's saying that this is equivalent to what's on the right-hand side. So what this is saying, essentially, is um, even when the model, uh, the critic model, is misspecified, we can find the optimal policy if the critic is modeled in such a way that it satisfies the compatibility condition. And the compatibility condition kind of guides us as to how we should model M. I want to uh, just take a moment to mention that um, what has been done uh, as it relates to robustness in the statistics literature. And uh, so Michael Rosenblum um, wrote this paper where uh, he presents a class of models that are robust to misspecification. And so this class of models includes linear models and generalized linear models. And so what he found was that even if the actual data generating distribution is different from the working model that um, you use, that tests that are based on the working model are still um, asymptotically valid under the null hypothesis. Okay, so um, to kind of restate that in a different way, uh, robustness means the following, that we say that a hypothesis test at level alpha is asymptotically robust to misspecification if for any data generating distribution that satisfies the null hypothesis of no treatment effect, the asymptotic probability of rejecting the null hypothesis is at most alpha. Okay. So I need to mention that um, that finding is in the context of randomized trials. So a key assumption is that we have the orthogonality of the treatment assignment variable to the other variables. And the null hypothesis specifically, I should mention, is not that of one of an unconditional effect, but um, it's, it's testing a conditional treatment effect. So testing a treatment effect within strata of baseline variables, because after all, um, the paper was about using linear models to um, address hypothesis tests in RCTs. So, uh, so it's a specific hypothesis. Okay, um, and I wrote this reaction to that note um, back when I kind of was involved in more survival analysis. Um, and it was just an analogous kind of result that shows that a class of parametric proportional hazards models and um, the Cox model it, um, are also robust to misspecification. Um, and there's been work already that's been done on the Cox model, but I'm showing using a different argument that's used in the literature. Okay, so now I just want to give you kind of a general flavor of how um, to, uh, what's the key idea of constructing robust tests in regression settings. And this idea can be applied to the after critics setting. So let's just say that the null hypothesis is that the <coughs> conditional mean does not depend on x. So x is the term that we're trying to test. Um, and let's say that the misspecified model is just a linear model here uh, with three parameters. And what I'm going to do for the sake of this argument is I'm just going to rewrite the vector of parameters beta so that the coefficient that's related to the term that we're trying to test comes first, so I'm just reordering it so that beta one just appears first because I'm, that's the beta that I'm interested in. So, and then the rest will be in the, in the remainder of that vector. So that's all I'm doing there. Um, and the beta bar, um, those are the rest of the parameters. So <coughs> score-like set of um, functions can be uh, expressed here, and this is just the derivative of the sum of squares with respect to beta here. And the null hypothesis equivalently stated is that beta one is zero, right? 
So, um, yeah. So we're basically testing the term x. So it, beta 1 is 0, which means that x does not um, matter in the conditional uh, mean. So the goal is to try to use S1, um, this part of the, uh, the score type function, um, as a test statistic, but in order to do that, we would need to replace the nuisance parameters, beta bar, with an estimate, right, in order to use it as a test statistic. So to that end, we're just going to define beta tilde to be the solution to this set of equations here. And we're going to say that um, the limit of the estimators uh, is beta star. And because, by the way, that we constructed beta tilde um, to be the solution to these set of equations, then um, the limit of the average of S0 and S2 should be zero, just by the way that we've um, set up beta tilde. Okay. So we've established the unbiasedness of S0 and S2 under the null hypothesis. And now we want to uh, use S1 as a valid test statistic, but what we need to do is we need to show the unbiasedness of S1 um, under the null hypothesis, evaluated also at the limit beta star right there. So how do we do that? Well, we'll just evaluate um, the expectation of S1, and um, when x and z are independent, we're able to express that um, function S1 as a product of two functions. Really one um, depends on x and the other depends on z here. And, um, and here, we're just kind of, we're leveraging the fact that we've already established the unbiasedness of S0 there. So this was, um, so we've shown here the uh, unbiasedness of S1, and this works because what we did was we expressed S1 as a product of um, you know, two functions, one that depends on x and one that's z, using the independence, and then already um, applying the unbiasedness of this part here. Okay, so that means that um, we can, um, we've shown the uh, robustness of this test statistic, S1. Okay, so going back to the actor critic um, setting. Uh, so here's, I'm going to state the analogous question here. And let's just assume um, two contexts for simplicity. And our null hypothesis, we want to test whether the first context really matters. So does, is the variable S1 really important? Um, does optimal policy depend on S1? And the question is when um, pi, the policy, does not belong to the function class, uh, pi theta, which is another way of saying the specification, like when pi, when, op, so when the optimal policy doesn't actually belong to that function class that we have um, specified here, what happens to the hypothesis test that's actually based on the maximizer of V tilde, where M here is the um, misspecified model? Okay, so that's the question, that's the analogous question. And for now, I'm going to consider an augmented model. I have the same um, sort of policy that I introduced before, but I've just augmented this with um, G star, where G star is uh, this conditional expectation of G1 given S2. And um, for now, just kind of suspend any kind of disbelief or suspicion, but I'll, that will be clear later. Um, and I'm gonna do the same trick that I did before, where I just reordered the parameters. I put beta one first, um, and then I put the rest of the parameters later. So these are nuisance parameters. 
So as before, we have a set of score type of equations where um, I'm going to define u to be the derivative of uh, v tilde with respect to um, theta. So the null hypothesis, because we're testing whether S1 actually matters in the policy, uh, the null hypothesis is whether, whether theta1 equals 0. So in order to use u1 as a test statistic, what we need to do, as before, is replace theta bar with, its, with estimates, estimators. So theta tilde, um, I'm going to define as being the solution to the, these set of equations. Okay. And these, um, you know, these are just uh, before, as I stated, that's related to um, the derivative of v tilde. And theta star, um, as before, I'm going to um, denote theta star as the limit of theta tilde. And we have um, the unbiasedness of these score type um, functions, u0, u2, and u3, and using the same kind of argument that um, I just used in the prior few slides, that by construction of theta um, tilde, I've defined those to be the so solutions to the set of equations. So the limit, um, the limit of the average, of course, is going to be zero. Okay. And so for u1 to be a valid test statistic, to test this null hypothesis, um, the key is to show the unbiasedness of u1 under the null hypothesis, evaluated at theta star, okay? So the expression for u1 looks like the following. And before in the regression setting, it was fairly um, nice in that I was able to separate an expression that um, I was able to separate S1 as a function that depends only on X and one that depends on Z, and I used the independence of X and Z um, to, to establish the unbiasedness. But in this case, I can't really do that because the misspecified um, function for the reward here still depends on S1, the first context and the second context. So unfortunately, it's not as um, kind of clean and easy as the last um, setting. So what I have to do, what we have to do is then consider um, modeling the reward in such a way um, that it would kind of work out. So what it turns out that we can um, center the covariate in this misspecified model here. Um, and we can replace this covariate with a centered version, where f bar looks like this sort of weighted mean. And the um, last expression on the bottom can be um, verified here. But essentially, what this centering enables us to do is um, it enables us to express here, um, this is the portion of the expression, I'll just, just remind you here, um, of u1. So remember, u1 has this form, and the whole issue is that I couldn't, that m depends on s1 and s2. But once I center the variable, the covariate, I'm able to um, express it as such. And um, then this term here, uh, depends only on S2 instead of S1. So that's um, really helpful because I've already established the unbiasedness of U0 here, okay? So since I have that, um, going back to the expression U1, uh, I can then, I have a term that depends only on S1, a term that only depends on S2, and if um, S1 and S2 are independent, then that's great because, because uh, U0, this part here is, um, resembles U0, so I take the expectation of U0 and it's unbiased, so that I'm going to this is zero. And, and um, so that's nice when S1, when the two contexts are independent, but 
um, even if they're not independent, um, I can kind of re-express that expectation as a conditional expectation of g of s1 given s2. And, um, and it turns out, well, I had the unbi I, I had mentioned that, that I had the unbiasedness of s3 from the beginning, um, from earlier on. And um, this, is, this kind of gives you some insight as to why I augmented the model for the policy model. It's because I wanted to pull out this, um, I wanted to pull out this trick kind of at the end so that I get the unbiasedness of U1. So even if S1 and S2 are not independent, I can use the fact that we have the unbiasedness of U3 in order to establish um, that that expectation of U1 equals zero here. So there were two things that I had to do to make that work. Um, one was centering first the covariate and the reward model. And then the second thing was that I did have to augment the model, the policy model, using G star. So with those uh, two um, modifications, I can, we can uh, go ahead and use U1 as a valid test statistic. Uh, test statistic. Okay. So this just shows you how you would go about doing it. Um, you just replace um, kind of the sample versions here, and you can construct a test statistic uh, using the score type quantities here. And the variance could be obtained using a linearization method. I've kind of suppressed all of the details of that um, here. So that basically gives you um, a robust test, even when um, here, even when the policy pi doesn't belong to the function class um, that we're using pi theta. Okay. So I just want to summarize kind of what I just talked about um, in the past hour. Um, the motivation of this really is that we're dealing with a real issue. So the problem of testing the utility of information that we collect from watches is an issue, a practical issue that we need to um, deal with. And we consider testing variables in the actor critic bandit but we considered specifically when the models used in the algorithms are not perfectly specified. It turns out uh, we can construct robust tests for the policy parameter with an augmented model and by centering a covariate, the covariate and the reward model in such a way. And this work really illustrates that because of the model assumptions that are used um, in the bandit, that the bandit does inherit problems that are prone to uh, when you use models, right? So you have to think about, we do have to think about consequences of misspecifying models. Um, the existing literature doesn't exactly apply to this problem just because um, we're, we're dealing with the average reward and that objective function is a little different than you know, the usual log likelihoods that we're, that we're used to seeing. And what I dealt with today was really the estimation problem. I, this sequential decision-making problem has to be dealt with. So in all of the work that I mentioned kind of presupposes that we're um, doing hypothesis tests after a certain number of trials. Um, we might have to think about using sequential or repeated hypothesis testing. And um, I did want to acknowledge the um, chapter in Professor Murphy's um, book that really addressed other issues when using um, contextual bandits in mobile health. And some of these other issues include variable selection and um, the selection of initial values. So to that end, that's why um, offline policy evaluation would be um, really helpful to um, kind of guide um, suggestions for initial values. And um, just suggesting that you know, we might need to think about how to um, build uh, large databases or data sharing that would um, help for that 
for that goal. Um, yeah, so that's the bulk of uh, my talk, and happy to take any comments or questions or take any discussion offline and continue. Thank you. We're, it's going to um, be eight weeks. So we're going to be following up um, people for eight weeks. So they get a watch, yes. They, yeah, we will be asking them to return watches, yeah. But we understand that it, it might not, we're not guaranteed seeing them, seeing them again. They do have to have an iPhone um, in order to, to participate, yeah. The right, I I think that's so the um, adjust the different um, objective. objective function. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think to give you a better answer, I probably need to think about it and maybe discuss offline. Um, but I think that's a point that merits um, some deeper thought. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I don't actually know firsthand. Um, I know at least part of the challenge is in working in this area. I think it's we're very siloed, at least academics and um, and industry people. And I've I've tried in the past uh, to work with. I mean, I still do um, to work with kind of other healthcare startups, and they're very, very vigilant about keeping the data to themselves. And so, um, I do think that we all we all value um, having our own data, but but yeah, it is important to um, kind of be able to address issues with larger sets of data. Um, that's a good question. I personally haven't dealt with other wearable devices other than Apple. Um, so, yeah, I can't, I don't know if I can, I'm equipped to comment on that. Most of the other projects that I'm working on are focused on smartphone use and applications. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right.